Before we learn the fundamental theorem for finite abelian groups, probably the biggest milestone theorem in abstract algebra was Lagrange's theorem. But of course, Lagrange's theorem is also one of the most ripe theorems for undergraduates learning abstract algebra to abuse. After all, the most important thing to know about Lagrange's theorem is not just what it says, but what it doesn't say. Namely, the converse of Lagrange's theorem is not in general a true statement. But with the power of the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, we're going to be able to show that in fact the converse of Lagrange's theorem does hold on the category of abelian groups. If we know our group is abelian, we actually are going to get a converse for Lagrange's theorem in this video. Remember, what Lagrange's theorem does say is that for any finite group G, if I know that a subgroup H exists in G, then the order of H divides the order of G. So if G has order 120 and H is a subgroup of G, then that means that H can have order 24 or might have order 60, but its order must be a divisor of 120 in that case. So Lagrange's theorem tells me what the order of subgroups may be in a finite group. What it doesn't tell us in general is it doesn't tell us given a divisor of the order of the group, that such a subgroup must exist. Lagrange's theorem cannot guarantee the existence of a subgroup of a given order. And that's one of the many ways in which undergraduates want to try and abuse Lagrange's theorem. It doesn't go the other way. Just because we have a subset whose order divides G doesn't mean that that is a subgroup of G. Not every divisor of the order of G is realized as the order of a subgroup of G. But when we add the word abelian into the mix, that changes everything for the converse of Lagrange's theorem. Because if G is an abelian group of order N, and I pick a divisor, K, of N, then the converse of Lagrange's theorem actually does hold. There does exist a subgroup H whose order is equal to that divisor, K. And this is super good news, because it means for abelian groups, Lagrange's theorem works both ways. Every subgroup has order that divides the whole group, and every divisor of the order of the whole group is realized as the order of a subgroup. In the abelian case, we get both directions, and we don't have to have our guard up about whether we're using Lagrange's theorem inappropriately. So coming back to our groups of order 1008, let me ask the question, how could we know that there does exist for sure a subgroup of order 24? 24 happens to be a divisor of 1008. How do we know that there's an order 24 subgroup somewhere in every single one of these examples, every one of these 10 possibilities? Well, 24 is 2 to the third power times 3. And we can apply, again, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups to say that this subgroup of order 24, because it's abelian, must be isomorphic to one of these three possibilities, z8 plus z3, or z4, z2, z3, or z2, 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 z3. That's the fundamental theorem in action. Now, how do I know that each one of these 10 groups G has a subgroup that lines up with one of these three possibilities? Well, let's take the Z8, Z3 case. I know I can just spot directly from this example that we already have a Z8 factor and a Z3 factor. So if I take those two factors and I trivialize out the others, 2, 3, and 7, then I'm going to get a subgroup Z8 plus Z3, a subgroup isomorphic to Z8 plus Z3. But that same subgroup also exists in this example. If I take the, the whole subcyclic uh, factor Z8 here, but then from the Z9 factor, I pluck out the cyclic subgroup generated by 3, which is an element of order 3 in that factor, then that direct product is going to give me a subgroup of this, which is isomorphic to Z8 plus Z3. And likewise, by plucking out the order 8 elements in Z16, we can also build a Z8 plus Z3 isomorphism class subgroup in these two examples also. The Z4, Z2, Z3 example can be built from uh, the factors inside of each of these three direct products. And the Z2, 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 Z3 isomorphism class can be realized as subgroups of these last two examples. So this is kind of a concrete example where if I take all my possible groups of order 1008, all my abelian groups of order 1008 up to isomorphism, I can explicitly find within them, using the... the the direct product formula that the fundamental theorem gives me specifically locate subgroups of order 24. And those subgroups happen to have different structures for these different groups, right? There's these four possibilities that have the order 24 subgroup look like this. These four order 1008 groups have order 24 subgroups look like that. And these two order 1008 groups have order 24 subgroups look like this. So that's the, the, the specific case. 
Why should we expect this thing to be true in general? Why is the converse to Lagrange's theorem true in the general case for abelian groups? Let's furnish a proof. And my proof is going to make use of the strong form of mathematical induction. Because what we want to do is we want to try and build up this uh, converse to Lagrange's theorem from smaller order groups to larger order groups. So the base of my induction is going to be the case where my group has order 1. My group is a trivial group. So if G is a trivial group, if the whole group is trivial, then of course Lagrange's theorem is going to work both ways because all the subgroups of a trivial group are trivial and 1 divides 1, so no problem. Also, if my divisor K is 1, then of course that subgroup of order 1 always exists because the trivial subgroup is always a subgroup of any group. So the base case is not terribly interesting, but we can dispatch with it fairly quickly. Now we're going to make a strong induction hypothesis on N. Remember, with strong induction, we need to know, in order to topple a domino, not just that the previous domino fell by itself, but that all of the dominoes before it all fell. Right? So we need the weight of every single domino to push the next one over in a strong induction argument. So my induction hypothesis is not just to assume that this result is true for a specific value of n. I want to assume that this result holds for everything whose order is less than n. So assume that every group that's smaller than my g meets this Lagrange converse. That's my strong induction hypothesis. Our burden of proof is then to show that my group of order n necessarily also satisfies this Lagrange converse. So there's the shape of my proof. So I'm going to start by taking k, which is the order of the the order that I want to try to realize is the order of a subgroup, and factoring it as p times q, where p is a prime, uh, and q might have some powers of p in it. Doesn't really matter. We just care that we're peeling off a prime p from my k. So if I let k equal pq, where p is a prime, then we know for sure p divides k, but we also know by assumption that k divides n. So p divides k, k divides n. So p also divides n. That's going to be important in a minute. Now let's hit this thing with the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. In fact, it's a bit of a heavier hammer than we really need. We could actually just get this out of Cauchy's theorem. Um, but if we hit this with the fundamental theorem of abelian groups, what it tells me is that there for sure is going to be a subgroup of G that has order equal to P, because P is a divisor of N, and P is prime. That's the key here. P is a prime. And so we know there's going to be, in fact, it's going to be a cyclic subgroup. Um, so there must exist an element A of order P inside of this group, and the cyclic subgroup that it generates is a subgroup whose order is P. So I'm going to call that subgroup K. Now think about the cosets of that K. The cosets of K, since G is an abelian group, K is going to be a normal subgroup of G, and therefore G mod K is going to be a nice well-defined factor group. And it is going to be a factor group whose order is N divided by P. We can form that quotient because P divides N. Now we apply the induction hypothesis to the group G mod K, because G mod K is an abelian group, and its order, n divided by p, is strictly less than n. Therefore, the inductive hypothesis applies, and so Lagrange is true for G mod K. So therefore, there exists a subgroup of G mod K whose order is a divisor of n divided by p. And n divided by p is going to have as one of its divisors k divided by p because k divided by p is a divisor of n divided by p, because k is a divisor of n. But k divided by p is exactly q. So therefore, there exists, by our induction hypothesis, a subgroup of g mod k whose order is q. And every subgroup of a quotient has the form of a subgroup of g mod that same k. So we're going to call this subgroup h mod k, that has order q according to our inductive hypothesis, we're going to call it h mod k. Think of it in this diagram as being the group that consists of these two rows of the factor group g mod k that has all four of these rows as its elements. So h mod k is this subgroup of g mod k. And now all we have to do is lift that subgroup of the quotient up into a subgroup of g itself. Just by taking the h of which this h mod k is the quotient by k. That h is a subgroup of g, and the order of h just by Lagrange's theorem again, is equal to the product of the order of k, so the, the four elements or whatever, however many p elements that I have here in this row, multiplied by the number of elements in h mod k, but that's equal to p times q, and p times q is what we called k. 
And therefore, for abelian groups, the converse of Lagrange's theorem is indeed true. Every abelian group of a given order will have a subgroup whose order realizes any divisor of the order of that group. And that really illustrates, turns out we didn't need the fullness of the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, but this is a kind of a good time to talk about the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups actually gave us the existence of this order P cyclic subgroup that's sitting right here. And then once we had this order P cyclic subgroup, we were able to make the rest of this argument to show why any divisor of the order of G is realized by the order of some subgroup of G. So for abelian groups, finite abelian groups, Lagrange's theorem works both ways. I still have to caution you, though, don't use it unless you know your group is finite and abelian. But if you do, now we have a proof.